Inside Cuba, is there an after Castro? Next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Hello, I'm Dr. William Vokey. Welcome to International Focus. Tonight we examine Cuba today and ask the question, is there an after Castro? Joining me is Dr. Susan Purcell, President, Vice President of the Council of the Americas and the America Society in New York City. Dr. Purcell has done extensive consulting on Latin America. Prior to, prior to joining the Council of the Americas and the America Society, Dr. Purcell was a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations in New York. She also served as a member of the U.S. Department of State's policy planning staff, serving under Presidents Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Before joining the U.S. government, Dr. Purcell was a tenured professor of political science at UCLA. She's also been an international relations fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. Dr. Purcell, welcome to International Focus. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Uh, let's start with uh, Cuba. Let's start with the economic situation in Cuba today. What's, what's the character of the economic system and, and what's the economy like today? Well, the economy is in very bad straits. Um, most of the problems uh, are the result of socialist economics and the fact that it's a command economy basically centered around Fidel Castro, uh, which means that the basic laws of economics are very often not followed. And if it's a choice between making a political uh, decision or an economic decision that is uh, relevant to the economy, the political interests are the ones that win out. There are also some external factors that uh, contributed to the economic situation. One was Hurricane Michelle last year. Uh, one uh, is the results of the uh, September 11th terrorist attacks because as a result of that, international tourism declined, uh, particularly European visits to Cuba. So uh, Europeans are able to travel to Cuba? Oh, yes. Uh, well, yes, U Europeans, any, any, anyone? anyone else can travel to Cuba um, except the Americans because of the uh, U.S. embargo, which includes an embargo on tourism. Mm -hmm. So tourism was another area in which the economy declined last year? Yes, absolutely. Um, and tourism had become, prior to September 11th, um, the biggest earner of foreign exchange. It had already supplanted sugar, which traditionally had been the biggest earner of foreign exchange for the Cuban economy. So we had Hurricane Michelle, tourism. What were the anything else in terms well, of the economy? Well, yeah, the rising price of oil um, is also hard for Cuba because Cuba is a net importer of oil. And most recently, the uh, crisis in Venezuela, the seven-week-old uh, strike against uh, the uh, the government of Venezuela, uh, that affects Cuba because the Venezuelan president uh, Hugo Chavez has an agreement with Cuba whereby. He is selling uh, Cuba subsidized oil, subsidized very favorably in, in, in Cuba's So not, not at world market prices then? Oh, no, far below. So this is a little bit like the scheme the Russians had with Cuba in, prior to 1992, isn't it? Right. I mean, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the Soviet Union was exchanging oil for Cuban sugar at highly subsidized prices, which um, the subsidies of the oil accounted for the bulk of the estimated four to six billion dollars of aid annually that the Soviet Union used to give to Cuba. And that fell away in, in 1992. Yeah, it fell oh. away because, well, it fell away, the Soviet uh, Union collapsed in 89 and then stuff that was in the pipeline kept arriving, but by 91, 92 it was, it was finished. Mm -hmm. and, and did Cuba have to make any major adjustments then? I mean, that's a huge chunk of money for the, the Cubans to have lost. Yeah, it was, it was such a major change that many people thought it would bring about the almost immediate collapse of the Cuban economy. And for several years, the, uh, the Cuban economy seemed on the verge of death. But what happened was um, uh, the Castro government was rather clever. They shifted gears. They decided to make up the shortfall in part by welcoming uh, foreign investment. But it's under very strict terms in order to ensure that the new money going into Cuba goes almost totally into the hands of the Cuban government and very little will go into the hands of the people. The fear of the Castro regime is that if the Cuban people were to get their hands on a lot of the resources, they then would become less dependent on the Cuban government and might take steps to um, reduce the authority and power of the Cuban government over them. So, so, that, uh, so that investment and, and tourism you mentioned, there really wasn't much foreign investment in tourism before the early 
No, no, not at all. And those are both steps then to, to increase the amount of income t Cuba has to replace this subsidy. Yeah, mainly foreign exchange. Cuba needs hard currency in order to buy oil on the stock market and lots of the other kinds of things that Cuba has to import. They can't use the Cuban peso. It's not an internationally accepted currency. So they need dollars or, they need do or the Basically euro dollars. or, yeah, or right. whatever. Right. Well, then, uh, in terms of a command economy, you've mentioned that two or three times. That's not something Americans are very familiar with. What, give me an illustration of a command economy. How would that work, for instance, if, if I were a hotel and invested in Cuba? If I were a Spanish hotel and put 49% of the investment into a hotel? Well, for example, there's this very widespread belief that uh, engagement with the Cuban economy and with the Cuban government would be a way of liberalizing the Cuban political system. That if we allowed tourists to come in and just, you know, lifted our embargo, the people, the money that would be coming into Cuba from the United States would change attitudes of the Cuban government, change attitudes of the Cuban people, and bring about the I guess the slow democratization of the government and the opening of the political system. Which is and, essentially the China analogy. Yes, in part. And, and Castro believes that analogy, which is why he's not going to let it happen. So that in Cuba you have this system, which is very clever from the uh, regime's point of view, is, for example, if, uh, if I'm coming in and I'm going to build a hotel and I want to hire workers to build it, I cannot pick my own workers. The so workers. I, don't, I just don't go out and say I want maids. No, no, no. You can't. You have to hire them from the government, and any worker that you get has been carefully chosen and vetted by the Cuban government. Then comes time to pay them, and let's assume just for I don't know for uh, illustration's sake that you're going to pay them ten dollars for the day. Well, so you take your ten dollars, but you can't give them to the worker. You have to give your ten dollars to the Cuban government. The actual rate of exchange of how much a Cuban peso is worth compared to a U.S. dollar is approximately 25 Cuban pesos equal one dollar. But when you pay the wages to the Cuban government for this worker, the Cuban government has its own totally artificial rate of exchange, which it has declared is one to one. That means for every ten dollars you give the Cuban government, the Cuban worker is paid by the Cuban government only one peso instead of 25 pesos. So a huge portion of that then is retained by the government. Sure, that means that 24 out of 25 um, pesos, or 24 25ths of each dollar that's invested and is supposed to go toward wages is kept by the government. So that foreign investment is overwhelmingly strengthening the Cuban government at the expense of the Cuban people. Well, why are these jobs in tourism then, in the hotels, tour guides, etc.? Why, why are those jobs so desirable on the part of the Cuban people then? They're I mean, they're only, they're only getting uh, uh, what they normally would get as a maid in, uh, in a government building. Right, but they're very desirable because um, these workers come into contact with foreigners and they get tips in dollars and very often they'll get all kinds of little extra payments if they're good and the hotels like them. So, but the, the issue is really that they get hard currency in tips and almost anything that you want to buy in Cuba today and anything that you need is only available in the dollar uh, shops or on the black market for dollars very often. So that if you want to feed your family well and if you want basics such as soap and toilet paper, etc., you either buy them in the dollar store for, do for dollars or you buy them in the black market often for dollars too. I was surprised when I was in Cuba. Uh, the last time last March that uh, that you can still on the streets never have to change dollars. You use dollars for everything: taxi cabs, restaurants, uh, buying an apple. Right. And uh, because it, with pesos, there's nothing to buy almost. So, so the the economy in Cuba is a command economy, meaning that that most most do, most income of any kind runs first through the government. Well, yeah, but that's not the only definition. I mean, a command economy basically means that El Jefe Supremo, you know, the chief, the supreme chief, Fidel Castro, can make whatever decisions he wants. I mean, there, this is an economy, this economy is more closed than, and more controlled by the center than any of the Eastern European economies ever was under communism, and, and perhaps more so than most of the Soviet economy was during most of its history. There are no independent anythings in Cuba, basically. Uh, the only institution that has some, that is independent is the Catholic Church, and there a form of self-control or self-censorship operates because the Church knows that if it has seen if it is seen as in any way going beyond a purely religious function uh, into anything that's vaguely considered political, 
it, it can be closed down, the people can, can be made to leave, etc. So in Cuba, you have no independent labor unions, you have no independent press, you have no independent organization of any kind except for the Catholic Church, everything else. Any kind of organization is basically organized by the Cuban government, the youth movement, the women's movement, whatever you can think the, of. The baseball teams, etc. Yeah, everything is Cuban government. So uh, I understand, though, today that there are relatively few political prisoners in Cuba, uh, that the number of political prisoners is down in, in the neighborhood of 200 to, to, to 300. That, that doesn't sound like what we would think of as a repressive regime. Well, I mean, what are the... what? I don't know, there are only 11 million people in Cuba also, and the other answer is that a lot of the people who in other systems might ordinarily be in jail have been allowed to emigrate to the United States. Mm -hmm. so or, oh, yeah, that, that's the main, to mm -hmm. the United States. What, what's it like for, for uh, individuals who want to be politically active in Cuba? I mean, uh, it sounds like all the jobs come through the government then. Yeah, well, there are some. I mean, you know, there's been this legislation over the last decade or so where um, people are allowed to set up so-called paladares, these little restaurant establishments in their homes. But these restaurants have limits on the number of chairs they can have. Uh, you can only be partners with relatives. I mean, it's in the interest of the Cuban government to make sure that not too many Cubans are allowed to congregate together because there's always the assumption that if you allow, you know, a certain critical mass of Cubans to get together in any kind of official setting, that they're going to plot against the government. Um, so these things are kept small. And whenever any kind of establishment like these informal restaurants ends up being too successful, making too much money, the government either imposes draconian taxes so that it, it drains the profits from these, these, uh, these uh, family groups, or else it changes and it shuts them down. When we come back after our break in a few minutes, we're going to talk about American policy, but I, I want to make sure also we talk, there, there have been some benefits of the revolution, haven't there, though? Uh, they talk about education, they talk about their medical care, they talk about relative levels of uh, equality between low income and high, high. they talk about uh, racial relations uh, as all major benefits from the Batista regime prior to the revolution? Well, some are true and some aren't. I mean, education, yes. Uh, before the revolution, uh, people in rural areas or the very poor didn't have access to good education. I think one of the two chief accomplishments of the revolution was uh, free free access to free education for all, and the same with free health care. In recent years, though, because of the failure of the Cuban economy, free health care means less and less because you can't get aspirins in, in Cuba. And most of the sophisticated medicines and sophisticated machines are reserved only to treat foreigners who pay for it uh, in hard currency. And in fact, there's medical tourism to Cuba. People come to Cuba because Cuba has good doctors and provides all these services relatively inexpensively compared to, for example, the United States. But at the same time, Cubans can't get access to these, this more sophisticated uh, kind of uh, treatment and also to these medications. But I understand that, that in terms of medicine, uh, Cuba actually has produced so many qualified doctors, it exports doctors, and that, that there are essentially as preventive medicine clinics available to, to, to all the population. Is that, is that right? Yeah, when they have medicine. When they have medicine. Right. So they can prevent what's something that's wrong with you, tell you what, to, what not to do unless they have to prescribe something. Yeah, and um, the, the problem is, you know, Cuba is not kept from buying medicine from almost any country in the world, you know, and, and they can even buy it from us. But the problem is the way their resources are allocated when political considerations are the uppermost, then money is spent to keep political control instead of, you know, providing enough aspirins for the people. So uh, those, what about the other positive pieces of the revolution? Well, the issue Racial, about, income yeah. distribution, uh, yeah, you, you, well, kind of re you've recognized uh, two. Uh, two. That's, that's almost all I'll recognize because <laughs> um, racially, there's not all that much. I mean, I, I was at a meeting the other day um, with a black uh, Cuban defector uh, who now is supplying books, you know, sub rosa to, to independent libraries they're trying to spin up. And he said there are more dissenters that are black, more blacks in the dissenting movement than in the Cuban government. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to come back in just a moment and talk more. Uh, with Dr. Purcell about Cuba and particularly about the American embargo to Cuba. International Focus will be right back. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 
3183 or visit our website at www.sce.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. Um, I want to take just a second and tell our viewers that the Institute of World Affairs is sponsoring a trip to Cuba March 28th through April 7th. Uh, you're welcome to join us on that trip. It's a trip in which we're going to talk to uh, members of the government, the uh, German and the Mexican embassies, the uh, U.S. interest section in Cuba, and uh, have, a, have a nice opportunity to see what this country is really like and make some decisions on your own. I've been there twice myself, and, and I find it a beautiful, fascinating, and, and sometimes sad place. Um, uh, back, back to our discussion now. I, I'm really quite curious, and I, and I should I should note that that you and I disagree a little bit on some of our our views um, about some of the the advantages of the revolution and a little bit about U.S. policy. But I, I want to ask you uh, about Castro and the role that Fidel, the the great leader, plays in Cuba. Uh, is it all dependent on Castro, or, or aren't, aren't there other institutions that have developed and also play a role in the political process? Well, it's the, it's the usual situation where the man, the charismatic leader who made the revolution and is still alive is basically the center of power. But in recent years, um, more and more people are talking about uh, succession, succession uh, after Castro dies. He's about 76 years old. And so more and more power has been given to Raul Castro, Fidel's younger brother, who is five years younger. The assumption always is that Fidel will die before Raul. I mean, it's not a guaranteed thing. Um, the armed forces is probably um, the most important uh, institution that keeps the, the system running. In the early years of the revolution, uh, there probably was a great deal of popular support for the revolution, for Fidel Castro. Even today, when he's so old, he has still, you can see the signs of the, the, the charisma, the charismatic personality that he had and, and has a little of still. So that, that, that charisma still affects the younger generation, but I, I, my impression is that there's a, a huge younger generation in Cuba that, that really doesn't know the revolution except as history. Well, yeah, it's the situation where, you know, the younger generation has grown up with free access to education, free access to health care. And 99 point some percent literate. Yeah, and, and they, they, they read and write. And so these are things that they take for granted. And in fact, they look around them and they see that in the last couple of decades, nothing has changed. And in fact, it's gotten much worse. And then they hear stories about, you know, progress in other parts of the world. And they know what's happening in the United States, too, because you have more and more Cuban Americans um, who are now allowed to visit Cuba. And they bring pictures of their houses and their cars. And you, they see the way they dress. And they bring things for their family um, down in Cuba. So um, the youth think that you know Fidel Castro is a, a big obstacle to their own well-being. Now, I should add that. I'm a little hesitant to say what the youth thinks or what this one thinks or that thinks because I truly believe that in repressive political systems such as the Cuban system is, you truly cannot have confidence in what the people think because the people are not allowed to express their views. There are no polls allowed, I mean independent polls allowed, and the only elections that there are in Cuba are uh, with candidates only from the Cuban Communist Party and only candidates that have been allowed to run approved by the Cuban government. We noticed on, on our, my two trips to Cuba, I've noticed that uh, uh, the same thing, that people are very reluctant to talk. They'll talk about anything uh, and, except criticizing the supreme leader uh, and criticizing some of the, the political aspects of the regime. There, there's a real sense of, of very cautious uh, approach to that. Yeah. What, what, what about the other institutions? Talk a little bit about the, the military, the bureaucracy, the Communist Party, uh, the 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 watch groups, the, the community watch groups that have developed, I mean, how are they still a strong or a separate function? The, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which were sort of neighborhood spy uh, organizations, have, begotten, have gotten less powerful because as dollars have been brought in by Cuban Americans and given to the relatives, that means that there are more Cubans that have independent sources of income. Uh, they're not dependent on the state, and so therefore they're less beholden to, or they're less frightened of, the, of the, the economic consequences of going against the regime, which usually mean you lose your job and you can't, you can't and get you a job. Your, and if you lose your job, you don't have a job, you don't have income. You don't have income unless you have relatives right. in, in the United States. We, sh we should note, money. I guess, for, for, our, for the audience that, that it is legal for people to send money back 
to, oh, sure. to their Oh, sure. Cuban Americans and but that was new, that was new as of ninety two. Yeah, wasn't it? under the Clinton administration, um, you can send as much as uh, twelve hundred dollars a year now, and there is some effort in Congress to increase this. Uh, I think this is a very great thing because um, even though I support the embargo, and we'll, we'll talk more about this this later, I know. Um, from my point of view, anything that gets money into the hands of the Cuban people and not into the hands of the Castro government is a good thing because it helps level the playing field between a repressive government and the Cuban people. Well, what about the military then, or the bureaucracy, or the Communist Party? We don't know that much about the military. The military, um, by some people, is, is held in high esteem because it's, it's got this image of having fought valiantly in Angola, etc., you know, for the rights of the oppressed abroad. but. Um, they don't play a very public role in Cuba, and no one knows exactly how they would behave. For example, in the event, say, there was a mass rally and there was some kind of spark, you know, that would set up, uh, set off a rebellion against Castro, such as occurred in Romania, for example. We don't know. Would the Cuban military fire on the Cuban people? Who knows? Um, we don't know if the we we tend to think that the military will stay loyal to Castro, that Castro will probably be able to die in power. Um, and uh, after that, we're not sure. If the military leaders feel that with the transition, their own lives are threatened, they might be imprisoned or, or executed or whatever, that will keep them loyal to a kind of Castroism without Castro. But now the military has also been dramatically downsized. Hasn't yeah, it? as a result of the economic situation and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Cuba has not been able to put the same kind of resources into the military as during the Cold War. And so there are some estimates that the size of the military is about half of what it was during um, the height of the Soviet mm -hmm. aid. So the military is really one of the one of the few uh, potentially independent sources of, of power and, and stability in a, in, a, in a transition after Castro. Yeah, potentially, but keep in mind that it's precisely this military that is the backbone of the Castro dictatorship. I mean, this is a dictatorship which, if, if you didn't fear military repercussions and police repercussions, uh, there would be much more protest against the regime. As it is, there has been some loosening um, in the sense that people feel more free, relatively speaking, to say their mind, and the number of dissenters um, is growing because, and they become more active. Well, we've uh, seen visits by the Pope and Jimmy Carter, and all of which have been designed in part to give more room for in the Cuban system, more room for the church, more room for dissent. Well, they were double-edged. I mean, <laughs> the people who were doing the visiting um, thought that the, they would give more room to the dissenters and the, the Catholics, etc., which is true. At the same time, they were designed by Fidel Castro to uh, project an image of greater democracy, right. democracy and, bring and tolerance, etc., and bring support. exactly mm -hmm. right and and more um, and more uh, criticism of the U.S. involvement. So, is there an after Castro? What happens after There are a few af after Castro's. I, sh I should say that with this kind of system where no dissent, um, you know, with, with the system is held to so tightly in the, by the center that you don't get the kind of information or the ability to organize that you do in other kinds of dictatorships, um, like, for example, in the Pinochet uh, dictatorship in Chile. So that means that until it happens, you don't know very often that's going to happen, as in Romania. One minute Ceausescu was really strong, and the next day he was gone. And so that's, that's a kind of scenario that's possible. But others think that, you know, once Fidel dies, there will be a kind of institutional takeover by Raul, and the, the institutions will keep functioning. But the question is, without the charisma of Castro, who was the revolutionary founder, Raul might have to make some changes himself and allow more of an opening, and so that would be one kind of transition. And so that's another, kind of a Castro without that's Castroism Castro without, without Castro. Ca yeah, exactly. And then the other transition is that upon the death of Castro, the people take to the streets. There could be chaos. There could be a civil war, or you could have the military step in to put down order. And either the military could decide to retain power, or the military could decide that it will spearhead a transition and prepare for elections. So any of these scenarios are so it could, possible. Uh, the, the Greek uh, form where the, the Greek kernels eventually transitioned into democracy is a format that the military could take there. Yeah, and I think a great deal of, uh, of how the military would behave in that kind of situation depends on what uh, kind of international pressure there is, uh, both within Latin America, Europe, Are we and sending US. any signals to the military? Um, we, don't, we don't have high-level talks with the military, but there are kind of informal talks. I think they're called fence talks between our military on Guantanamo Bay. You know, the United States still retains use of the base on, uh, at Guantanamo on in Cuba and the military on the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, now, let, let's get then, so 
we don't know what's going to happen after Castro, but we, there are a couple of possibilities. Right. Castroism without Castro, uh, chaos, or, or a gradual transition, perhaps under military leadership, either to, towards democracy or a military regime. Is that a good yeah, summary? Uh, right. Military, a uh, uh, kind of a somewhat looser dictatorship under the uh, mm -hmm. military, a more traditional Latin American political uh, military regime. Now, let me ask the, the other question about the embargo. Uh, the United States now embargoes uh, lots of trade, the only country in the world that embargoes trade, travel, a number of things with Cuba. Why keep it up? It hasn't worked. Well, first of all, when you say it hasn't worked, it depends what you think work means. Uh, if it means to topple Castro, then clearly it hasn't worked. If you mean to um, contain him and keep him from doing a lot of damage or more damage than he, he has been able to do, then to a certain extent it has worked. Um, and you know, suppose Castro were to fall tomorrow, then all of a sudden those who supported the embargo would say, see, it worked, and those who didn't support the embargo would say, no, he fell for other reasons. So this is a debate about how it worked, you know, that can never be resolved. In the same way, you know, why did the Soviet Union collapse? Was it the opening to, um, to the East that people say, or, uh, or, 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 or was it... Or or was it Reagan, Reagan and, and the missile, defense, the right. defense shield, et cetera? And this is a, the kind of debate of causality that will never be reserved. Depending on your ideology, you'll c arrive at different conclusions. But you, but you, but you support continuation of the embargo and, and continuation of it as it is right now or, or perhaps with some modification? Well, I think first we need to say a little bit of how it is now. I mean, people tend to think there's a total embargo. The embargo has evolved through the years. I mean, just in the last couple of years, it is now legal for the United U.S. companies of, to sell uh, foodstuffs and medicine to the Cuban government, but only for cash. And the rationale for this is that um, Castro already, the Cuban, Cuba owes like $11 billion um, to various uh, countries and institutions in the world. And so the United States government feels that if you extend, if you allow American business to extend credits to Cuba, Cuba's a deadbeat country, it doesn't pay its debts, so it will take the food and medicine, not pay its debts, and then the American taxpayer will end up paying, or maybe a company will do some write-offs, in which case the American taxpayer still um, pays, and that the extension of credit then becomes tantamount to giving aid to the, the uh, Castro regime, which is why so, um, the, the credits were not allowed. So, so we now have a, uh, an embargo that allows, uh, for instance, licensed travel like we'll be doing to Cuba, that allows uh, buying of, of these kinds of medical and, and food stuff. Right. Uh, it, should it stay where it is, or should we loosen that embargo, allow more tourism? We've got about, by the way, we've got about a minute left. Yeah, well, we could, you know, maybe we might consider allowing sales of some other things. I do not think we should allow tourism at this point because of the cash flow issue. When you sell to Cuba for cash, the money's coming out of the hands of the Cuban government into our companies. When you allow tourism, the tourist dollars are going almost overwhelmingly into the hands of the Cuban government because the Cuban government controls tourism. So your argument would be that uh, the embargo needs to stay in place to make sure we don't help the Cuban government and the things we should do to change are changes that would help the Cuban people, yes. like, like increased remittances. Yeah, anything that gives more resources directly into the hands of the Cuban people is good. Anything that puts more resources into the hands of the Cuban government is bad. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your position and thank you for your presence today. We really appreciate having you here in uh, Milwaukee. Come back again next week to International Focus.